Hello, everyone. How's it going? So I'm seeing a lot of new faces, so I'm going to ask my question, and I bet I'm going to see a lot of hands. How many people have never been to an author event at the library before? Raise your hands. That is what I thought. Welcome. We're so happy to have you. Who is excited to see Temple Grandin? Yay! Well, I'm Kristen Sorth, and I'm the director of the St. Louis County Library. And on behalf of the library, I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's event with scientist, inventor, internationally best-selling author, and world-renowned autism spokesperson, Dr. Temple Grandin. So give her a round of applause. She can hear you. I want to thank you all for purchasing tickets. And I don't know if you know this or not, but the proceeds will support the Library Foundation's early literacy programs and our award-winning author event series, which is what we're having tonight. And if you'd like to further support the Library Foundation, I encourage you to join our Friends organization. And we have a table in the back um, that the Friends is, are staffing, and so you can stop by if you have any questions about joining our Friends. Tonight's event is sponsored by the library's Reading Garden event series for young audiences, and that is sponsored by Maryville University, Commerce Bank, Mercy Kids, and Companion Banking. So let's give them a round of applause. And of course, we have an amazing bookseller tonight, The Novel Neighbor. Who's been to The Novel Neighbor in Webster? They're amazing. They're here. Let's give them a big round of applause. They're in the back. They are a fabulous, terrific, independent bookstore in Webster Groves. If you haven't been there, go. I go there all the time, and it's an amazing place. They have additional copies of Miss Grandin's books for sale, including her older titles. So if you're interested, go see the ladies from Novel Neighbor. If you've not done so already, you can pick up your book, which came with your ticket purchase in the back of the room after the pre presentation. Temple will be signing books following the presentation in the library's north lobby. You should have received a line number. Does everyone have their line number? This is very important. When you pick up your book, make sure you have your line number. If you haven't already done so, get a line number um, in the back. We will call you up by group, and we ask that you please not line up until your group number is announced. I can promise you that it goes much faster than you think it will. We're uh, pretty seasoned folks around here, and so you won't be waiting too long in line. Um, I know that Desiree gave you some instructions uh, a little while ago about tonight, and she will come up and talk about that a little bit more after the program. During the book signing, you will have a chance to take a photo from the line, and a library staff member will take your photo for you in order to keep the line moving. Video recording is not permitted at any time, and we ask that you please limit photos during the presentation to the first minute to avoid distracting other attendees. So everybody have their phones, everything ready? So in the first minute that Temple's up here, take all the pictures that you want. We are also pleased to be working with one of our favorite media partners over here, HEC TV. Um, they are recording the event for a live stream on their website, which is HECTV.org, and they're going to archive the recording so you can watch it again and tell your friends. And we're so happy that, that we're here, they're here tonight. So give them a round of applause. Okay, on to tonight's presentation. Temple's waiting. She's like, wrap it up. Wrap it up. Okay. Our author this evening is one of the most highly regarded and popular individuals we have ever hosted. In fact, this event sold out in, can you guess, only four hours. Who had, who, you all are lucky, so lucky to be here. Dr. Temple Grandin is a professor of animal science at Colorado State University and a pioneer in improving the handling and welfare of animals in our food industry. Today, half the animals in the country are handled in facilities she designed. She is the author of the groundbreaking, internationally best-selling books, Animals in Translation, Thinking in Pictures, The Way I See It, and The Autism Brain. Diagnosed with severe nonverbal autism at the age of two, Dr. Grannon is now a champion for an inspiration to millions of individuals with autism. 
Dr. Grandin lectures to parents and teachers throughout the country on her personal experiences with autism and is a past member of the board of directors of the Autism Society of America. Dr. Grandin's life story is the basis for HBO's Emmy award-winning film, Temple Grandin, who's seen it? Raise your hands. Awesome. Time Magazine named her to their list of the 100 most influential people in the world, and in 2011, she was inducted into the Cowgirl Hall of Fame. <laughs> Tonight, Temple joins us to share her new book for young readers, Calling All Minds, How to Think and Create Like an Inventor, a combination of personal reflections on her childhood and early days as a scientist and entertaining anecdotes on the history and science of famous inventions. Calling All Minds is an informative and inspiring guidebook for all of us who love to question, tinker, and invent. Please help me welcome our guest, Temple Grandin. Really great to be here today. I've got to get this mic off this stand. I like to hold it better. Lots of things to talk about today. And the first thing I want to talk about is my grandfather's patent. My grandfather was the co-inventor of the autopilot for airplanes. He worked with another man named Andrew Nickian. And uh, they had to tinker a whole lot to get it to work. And the idea was so novel that all the aviation companies thought it would never possibly work because it was something totally different. Think about hay baling. You know, hay bales used to be square, and then somebody's going to take the hay and wind it up like this. It's really crazy, but it worked. And they were tinkering and tinkering with it in this loft. This is a building in Springfield, Massachusetts. My grandfather rented a loft, but underneath... They were fixing trains and trolleys. And they finally figured out that the big metal trains underneath the workbench were messing up the autopilot. But it took them quite a while to figure that out. Of course, when the plane's way up in the air, there's no trains underneath it to mess up the magnetic field. But I used to ask my grandfather endless questions like, why is the sky blue? You know, why is grass green? And then we'd go visit the tide gates these are a picture I got from France because the original tide gates are gone. I tried to find them online. They no longer exist. But what tide gates do is when the tide goes out, they shut, and then this lagoon would stay full of water and not be a yucky mud flat. And I thought that was just really, really fascinating. So that's sort of where my interest in science started. Now, the thing I want to talk about is kids like to do real stuff. And I found this cover story on Science News Magazine, and I go, Wow. We got to get kids back doing a whole lot more real stuff. And I did plenty of that as a kid. As a kid. And in Calling All Minds, I've got my childhood projects. And I'm going to tell you about my aviation projects. They were my favorites. And I had to tinker and tinker and tinker to get things to work. Then I went to um, the University of Northwest Missouri, and they had it in a kindergarten there modeled on an Italian model. You get the little ones working really, really early, making robots out of broken computer parts. You know, I think Legos are great, but a lot of kids aren't graduating to tools. So this makes a tie-in, you know, to my business of working in the cattle industry. First of all, how did I get interested in the cattle industry? I was exposed to it when I was a teenager. But I've worked with lots of skilled tradespeople, really creative skilled tradespeople, they would probably be labeled autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD today. Well, they had paper routes when they were 11, and they had welding class in high school, and now they own metal fabrication companies. Own! This is what really bothers me, as I go back and forth between, okay, the livestock and the meat industry world. I was just there last week doing animal auditor training. Did it beautiful new pork processing plant. And you know what I learned in there? And I was really upset. We don't know how to make the specialized equipment anymore. And it gets back to skilled trades. Canadians are making it. The Europeans are making it. And some people might just say, well, maybe we don't need a pork processing plant. But I can tell you the New York subway needs to fix the rail switches and the signals. They've got a lot of problems. 
and we need skilled tradespeople to fix water systems. In the last month, they've had two water problems in really nice, fancy hotels like the downtown Pittsburgh Sheridan. We had a water main break there. They had no water for a whole day in the hotel at all. No water at all. We came this close to doing a conference this big, an all-day conference with porta potties. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been a mess? And then they, my publisher puts me up in a beautiful, gorgeous hotel in New York. And they put little signs in the room saying, Con Edison is going to turn off the hot water because they have an emergency repair. We're going to be needing people to fix infrastructure. I was appalled at the conditions of bridges in Chicago, and I didn't have time to get pictures of these weird brace things they put on concrete bridges so they don't fall down. <laughs> We're going to need people to fix this stuff. Good jobs that aren't going to go away. Yeah. And the kid that should be fixing this stuff is playing video games in the basement. <laughs> See, one of the big problems we've got today with the autism diagnosis is they changed it. So you're going from a no speech delay, just socially awkward kid, to maybe someone who can't dress themselves. And I'm seeing too many kids aren't learning basic skills, like shopping, things like that. I know a guy who's 75 years old. He built Willy Wonka's stainless steel food factory. Started out washing dairy equipment. And he goes, you know what? I gotta take this stuff apart to wash it, so I'm gonna figure out how it works. And we just discussed that he would probably be ADHD and a whole bunch of other labels. You know, see, this is the problem. I just saw, was talking to kids this, this afternoon, and um, uh, I saw a little boy there. He's probably, you know, like fifth grade, something like that. He looks like Google Computer Programmer Junior. <laughs> because I've been out to Google, I've been out to Microsoft, and I just see the 25-year-old version of the same kid. You see, I don't think in, 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 the, in the label. I'm seeing pictures. And I'm seeing too many kids aren't getting their skills developed. Skilled trades aren't for everybody. But there's about 25% that ought to go there. Good jobs. Computers are not going to replace you. Guaranteed not to get replaced by computers. Now, this is one of my drawings. In fact, this is the drawing that I used to sell Cargill in the late 80s on uh, designing all the front end of all the Cargill beef plants. When you're weird, what you got to do is you got to sell your work. Show your work off. It could be artwork. It could be music. It could be computer coding. It could be lots of different things. Sell your work. Now, why is this drawing marked you need to touch in order to perceive? I noticed a very weird, disturbing kind of thing that happened. As I watched the industry go from hand drafting to lay all these drawings for these great big, huge plants to computer drafting. And we started getting some very strange mistakes on drawings. This was going on in the mid-90s when everybody was switching over to computers. And weird mistakes like the center of the circle was not in the center of the circle. And the reason for that is that the person who had drawn the drawing had never built anything and he had never drawn by hand. He hadn't touched it. The old folks switching over, that was no problem. People that built things, that wasn't a problem. And even Pixar found they got to get them off the computer sometime and have them actually draw, like with paper, and pin it up on the hallway walls. I've been there. I've seen it. we got to get out and do real things. Well, last October, I got to go to Cape Kennedy. I got to see a real SpaceX launch. That was so cool, actually going there and seeing it. And there were lots of people that were probably dyslexic, autistic, Tourette's, all kinds of labels. Because the right stuff rode the rockets. But the misfits and the geeks, they built the stuff. <laughs> and I am saying that absolutely, absolutely seriously. And some of the most fun stuff I ever did was just figuring out how to build stuff. I mean, we'd sit around the job trailer and there'd be two things we'd talk about. How stupid the suits are, that's the first thing. And I... Uh, how to build stuff. Well, that is the Mars launching pad. And the person who designed that has Tourette's. So what would you rather be, Mr. Launchpad or Mr. Tourette's? Now, this brings up a really important thing. Autism's an important part of who I am, but career comes first. 
Because I know people that are probably on the autism spectrum, undiagnosed. These are all people 50 and older. They own metal fabrication companies. And one of them, a couple of them are really, really big. This is what really bothers me. When I was in high school, I did model rockets, loved model rockets. That was one of the projects I did with Mr. Carlock, my science teacher. But I went on the websites where you do model rockets, and you can buy them already made. That's not the point of model rockets. <laughs> we had to make them. You need to be building a model rockets. Now, engines you don't do, you know, engines you buy. That's a safety thing. But the whole rest of the rocket, <laughs> you build it. And there's the SpaceX rocket right there taking off at sunset. Really exciting. Yes, and I took these pictures with my iPhone. Just got the latest iPhone 6. I couldn't believe what good pictures it took. You know, that, that, it's pretty amazing. That's one of the pictures right there taken with an iPhone. Now, when I was a little kid, I loved to tinker with my aviation experiments. If it flew, I liked it. And this is a little um, uh, bird kite that's in the book. Now, the problem is I couldn't buy the exact materials I had when I was a kid. There was this like weird textured art paper that I had. Now maybe I could go to some strange website and buy it, but there's no way, easy way to get it. But what I've learned is the rough surface affects flight characteristics. So you may really have to experiment to get it to work. Now you'll notice on this bird kite, it has little winglets that are bent up. Yep, I invented those before jetliners ever had them. And I, yes, I, in the aviation companies, they got patents on it. But in order to get it to work, I had to tinker with it. You'll have to tinker with it. Maybe put some tape on it, uh, weight it down, try bending the wings different ways. Okay, so then I started studying more about rough surfaces. So we went into the history of the golf ball. And originally, golf balls were smooth. And then golfers found that when the balls got all beat up and scratched and cut up, they actually flew further because of rough surfaces reducing drag. And they originally thought that um, it, it was because the club gripped it. So that's why this was called the Agrippa ball. That's not the reason. It's because it's less drag. So there, you're going to have to experiment to get it to work. Now, the interesting thing about the golf balls is, uh, you know, this is one of these things that was sort of an accidental discovery. Now, there's a wingtip, a winglet. It's called a winglet. You can look these up on, on, on Google Images. So the first one, you just bend it up like that. That was the first one. And the thing that's interesting, when you look this up on Google Patents, they're shapes. I was just talking to third graders today. These patents are so simple that even little kids can understand them because these simply are shapes. But they're shapes that improve fuel economy. Well, then they might make it a little extra winglet like that. Or maybe you have this one here where it's hardly even a winglet. So you can experiment with different ways that you bend it. And there's a patent diagram off of a patent. It's simply the shape being patented. And then they also have some mathematical descriptions. And the designers <coughs> of airplanes have tried all kinds of things. Yeah, that's like totally beyond weird. Uh, you'd never see that on a commercial jetliner. That's on a single private jet. Just too weird. Now, the latest thing, I call this one the little girl with the curl because the winglet curls like this. I saw this on an Airbus at an airport recently, looked it up. Now, you might wonder, why is the back of the engine scalloped shape? That's to reduce noise. And again, it's simply a shape. And in the book, Calling All Minds, I've got Boeing's patent in there. Yes, second graders can understand Boeing's patent. It is strictly a shape, and it makes the engine less noisy. So then I thought, I wonder if golf balls with dimples fly through the air with less noise than smooth ones. I found a really weird, obscured paper, and I found out, yes, they do. <laughs> so you see right there, it's the same principles. Now another one of the projects is the optical illusion room, the Ames distorted room. The drawings online are terrible. I found out that the stage hands at HBO had a really horrible time figuring out how to build it. Our illustrator had tons of trouble with it. Um, but I think I've made some drawings that are going to make it easier. But my science teacher 
wanted me to figure out how to do it. Now, if I put a piece of cloth over this with a hole, then one horse is going to look twice as big as the other horse. And he gave me one hint. And the hint he gave me is he let me look in a psychology book where I could see this outline. This is from the titles of the movie. So if they can't figure out how to build it, they can watch the titles of the movie because it gives the actual hint that I got. Seeing that trapezoidal shape. It's really important that schools keep the hands-on classes. Sewing, cooking. I just recently went to a makerspace and they had sewing machines in it. They had 3D printers, all kinds of really nice stuff. But you can also do maker spaces with just simple things. Cardboard, you know, wood, just simple stuff. Get kids making things, playing instruments, woodworking. I was the second girl in my school allowed to take woodworking when I was in fifth grade. And my fifth grade woodworking project is in there. And it's a violin plant stool. And you cut it out with a little coping saw. Great saw for kids to be using. High school, welding. I know two people that I've worked with professionally. They were saved by that welding class. They own metal fabrication companies. And they definitely were kids that would have gone straight into special ed. And I'm seeing too many kids ending up in the basement playing video games. They're not learning to program them. Any benefit you can get from playing video games, you're going to get with an hour a day. I've looked at the research. You're not going to get it playing at eight hours a day. We also have a huge shortage of mechanics. Another thing I've been observing is a lot of grandparents are coming up to me. NASA space scientists, engineers, accountants, many different jobs. And they're finding out that they're on the spectrum when the grandkids are diagnosed. Why did granddaddy have a successful career? Because granddaddy had a paper route. He learned how to work. So what do we do with um, the kids today? How about walk dogs for the neighbors when they're 11 years old? Church or synagogue volunteer jobs, farmer's market. They've got to start learning how to work, doing stuff on a schedule outside the family. And I'm seeing way too many kids that aren't learning shopping. I talked to a mom just the other day, uh, no, well, it was about a year ago, and her 16-year-old fully verbal kid who looked like he ought to go straight to Silicon Valley had never shopped by himself. And when I suggested that he buy some printer paper, mom just said she couldn't let go. Well, I spent 25 years in the construction industry. One of the things I learned from the construction industry is you've got to get things done. No, he's got to go in and buy the printer paper. And then just a few months ago, I was at one of the airports. I just know it wasn't my own airport in Denver. And a mom and her 14-year-old daughter came up to me. And they both, um, the, the girl's saying, I'm a, autistic like you. And I said, have you ever shopped? And they're both squirming around. So I pulled a $5 bill out of my pocket and I said, go in that newsstand, buy something. And she did. That was the first time that she shopped. You see, the problem is, they recently changed the diagnostic guideline in 2013. So you've got this huge muck hole of a spectrum going from Silicon Valley person to a skilled tradesperson to somebody who might be just good at sales to um, somebody who'd be super good here in libraries and archiving. I'm really pleased with what they're doing here in the St. Louis area with libraries. Really, really wonderful. But I'm seeing since they changed that guideline, too many kids not living up to their potential. Then I go back in my other world, and I have discussed with these people that I've worked with professionally, mostly 50 and up, what they would like as kids. How about dyslexic stutterer, and he still stutters. ADHD, awful student, took welding, started making stuff and selling it, owns a large metal fabrication company. Now, I realize that not everybody on the spectrum can do this. But even you take the ones that are maybe nonverbal, they got more problems, let's get them to learn how to dress themselves. Let's try to figure out what they can do. Now, the thing is, autism in its milder forms is just brain variation. A brain can be more thinking, or a brain can be more social-emotional. People with autism have more people in technical careers. People with bipolar have more people in creative careers. Theater is another occupation that is not 
going to go away with because of computers. People are still going to want to watch live theater because the brain can be more thinking or the brain can be more social emotional. In the milder forms, it's just normal variation. People have a hard time with that, but I'm a visual thinker, so I don't see the labels. I'm seeing a boy that's this tall, and then I'm saying, oh, when I went out to California, I saw one that looked just like him, and he was that tall, and he's making $100,000 a year. You see, it's sort of like, I don't know, going around in some Star Trek transporter between all the things. <laughs> now, this is a fascinating paper that I found. The title is Genomic Trade-Offs. Are autism and schizophrenia the steep price for human brain? The same genes that make autism also make humans have a big brain. They're brain development genes. Autism is an overgrowth in the back of the head. So you get memory, maybe art or math, and you leave out some social circuits. Schizophrenia, you don't get quite enough cells. So then in adolescence, when the brain prunes back the bushes, you've got big problems. Okay, I want to ask you. What would happen to some top innovators today in the educational system today? What would happen to Steve Jobs, bullied in school, probably on the autism spectrum, and the little kids thought it was really funny when I told them that he brought snakes to school when he was in elementary school. <laughs> they thought that was a real riot. Um, what would happen to him today? How about little Albert Einstein right here? No language until age three? loved math and all of that kind of stuff. What would happen to these people today? And then I want to put in there Jane Goodall. She had a two-year secretarial degree when she did her famous work. It was equivalent to a community college secretarial certificate. I'm seeing too many kids labeled autistic, dyslexic, ADHD, and I'm worried about them getting screened out. Really, really does worry me. Okay. Oh, people with dyslexia, they're really good at running big businesses. Well, they have vision. Maybe this is why JetBlue has a good leg room in the back of the plane. Because <laughs> they can visualize how horrible it would be to sit in the back of the plane so squashed up. <laughs> and then how about the head of Ikea? ADHD, dyslexia? There's an interesting article by Betsy Morris and a book, too, by her. Thomas Edison was labeled as a hyperactive, addled high school dropout. He probably had autism. He was a naughty boy, too. Managed to burn up the baggage car of a train. He was supposed to be selling papers on the train. Had a paper route when he was very young. But instead, he was doing chemistry experiments in the baggage car. I don't think the railroad is real happy about that. Now, the thing is, he had to tinker and tinker and tinker to get the light bulb to work. And he said, invention is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And he had to try many, many different filaments until he found one that worked. And one of my favorite books when I was a kid was about famous inventors. Just loved reading their stories. Now, what are some of the common denominators of unique minds that are successful? Books and learning. You need to do, yeah, pay those taxes to support the libraries. That's some of the best money that you can spend. And I had early exposure to many, many different things. The cattle industry, I got exposed to that as a teenager. But I was exposed to all kinds of hands-on stuff when I was younger. I loved art class. I also learned work skills. When I was 13, my mother got me a sewing job. And I, um, I hemmed dresses and took apart dresses for a freelance seamstress. We need to just find things in the neighborhood that kids can do. I had a great science teacher, wonderful third grade teacher, really great. Also, I made my own internships before there were internships. There were people in the industry that were bad to me, but there also were people that helped me when they saw my drawings and they recognized my skill. Here are my two favorite elementary school books. And I noticed you got Curious George over there. And I really liked him because he was naughty. <laughs> Another favorite book was The Wizard of Oz. The Eloise books I really liked. And then there was a book called The Enchanted Island of You that Mother read to us. And it described all these fantastical places. And it was written by the author of The Wizard of Oz. 
Now, I really liked this study. Nobel Prize winners in science were 50% more likely to have an arts and craft hobby than just other scientists. Things like painting, music, photographer, building things. You see, that helped make them more creative. This is one of my most important slides, the different types of thinking. I am a photorealistic visual thinker. Everything I think about is a picture. So I see a boy this high, and then I see a boy 10 years older that's this high, and I'm saying one goes to Silicon Valley or great skilled trades or you know metal shop. Another one's going to the basement to play video games. They are the same kid. It's that simple. Now I think it's photos I think in. I think in photos, I don't think in words. And I'm a, then another kind of mind is your mathematical mind. This kind of mind is the pattern thinker. They think in patterns, not pictures. Think origami, think organic chemistry. These are your music and math kids. Now, oftentimes, these skills will show up around third grade, second grade. Art, for me, showed up in third grade, not in kindergarten, but in third grade. Little mathematicians will show up. Then give them harder math. Don't make them do boring baby stuff. And let them do it in their head, because that's how they think. Then you have the verbal facts guy. He knows everything about his favorite subjects, like baseball. He'd know everything about the Cardinals. Then you got the guy who's an auditory thinker. This is a guy that probably is dyslexic, but um, really good talker, great at sales. Now, it was really fun doing brain scan studies to travel around in inner space. And I found out that I've got a really big visual thinking circuit. Doing these brain scans, that was quite a trip. And there's an even bigger visual thinking circuit right there. But then, what's blue is full of water. Right here, it trashed out the algebra department. <laughs> I am really concerned that a lot of visual thinkers are getting screened out by the algebra requirement. I'm not suggesting not doing math. How about statistics? What saved me when I was in college was finite math, which was probability and statistics. And I just found out that our university is now going to allow uh, uh, students to uh, substitute algebra with statistics. Now, there's people in certain fields where you may need to take algebra. If you want to be chemistry, then you probably need to take it, uh, algebra. But we need the different kinds of minds. Let's just go back to this. Let's take something like the iPhone. Steve Jobs was an artist. He made the interface easy to use. The engineers had to make the inside of that phone work. You know, so when you swipe it, it actually works. You see, that's the two kinds of minds working together. Because if the engineers had made the phone, they'd make it so complicated nobody could figure out how to use it. <laughs> and this is what Thomas Edison had to say about mathematicians. I'm not a mathematician, but I can always hire some mathematicians, but they can't hire me. <laughs> That's what Thomas Edison had to say. And a lot of the people I worked with um, in metalworking, they were incredibly creative on just figuring out really ingenious mechanical devices. And then if you don't believe that these different kinds of minds actually exist, you can read my book, The Autistic Brain. I'll give you the science, give you a ton of science. I get worried that the educational system might be screening these kids out. We need visual thinkers. Mathematical thinkers calculate risk. Okay, what's the risk that this bridge might break? Visual thinkers see risk. We went under a bridge yesterday that I'm going, oh man, glad they got those steel braces on it because I think it would fall apart if it didn't have the steel braces on it. And when I found out why Fukushima burned up, they didn't see the risk. All I need to know about a nuclear reactor is if the electrically driven emergency pump does not work when I need it, guess what happens? And they put it in a non-waterproof basement. Simple watertight doors like you have on submarines, really low-tech things, it would not have happened. It's that simple. And what I've learned is the mathematical mind doesn't see it. I see the water going in there. Yeah. We need visual thinkers to make sure that we can replicate scientific experiments. This has been a problem in biomedical research. 
and I read about a cancer study where the results came out opposite because one scientist shook it really hard like this and the other one just did this to his samples and it totally changed the results completely. Now there's Grace Murray Hopper, the very important uh, computer programming pioneer. She was absolutely horrible at Latin. You know, see the thing is, people that are different tend to be good at one thing and really terrible in something else. Skills tend to be uneven. Let's build up the thing that the person is good at. This is Stephen Hawking's mathematics for his physics. Now the thing about Stephen Hawking's, Hawking is that he couldn't write. So he had to do it in his head, totally in his head. And some schools get all wigged out when the kid can't show the work. Don't make the kid show the work. That's not how he thinks. I take some precautions against cheating, but once I'd done that, let him do it. And he had to use a pattern form of math called Penrose diagrams based on this kind of tiling. You can look this stuff up online. It's very cool. You want to find a really, really wonderful mathematics site, use the image function on Google. Then type in geometry, solid geometry, fractals, trigonometry, calculus, all these different mathematical words. You'll find websites that you won't find on regular word Google. And the thing that Stephen Hawking had to say, concentrate on the things your disability doesn't prevent you from doing well. Math in his head, he could still do. And then he had the greatest time going weightless. So then the little kid's are asking me, uh, well, did he get to go on a rocket? I go, no, this is actually a converted jetliner, you know, like a regular commercial type plane. And they basically fly it like a roller coaster. It's called parabolas. And as they come down like this, then you're weightless for maybe about 20 seconds. And the kids also think it's really funny that sometimes people vomit. So the astronauts used to call this plane the vomit comet. <laughs> but Stephen Hawking just had an absolutely wonderful uh, time doing this. And he says, I could no longer write down the equations. They had to be translated into geometry in his head. Now the thing is, visual thinkers like me, artificial intelligence, and some people with autism and ADHD and dyslexia were bottom-up thinkers. All concepts are learned with specific examples, and that's exactly how an expert system works in artificial intelligence. And when I learned that about two years ago, I go, wow, wow, that's cool. Concepts are formed from specific examples. So you want to teach the kid a concept like up or down. You've got to give them a whole lot of specific examples, like the plane went up in the air. I jumped up. I put a cup up on the shelf. Top-down thinkers tend to overgeneralize. This is the problem we're getting with all these diagnostic labels. We're overgeneralizing. I see Google Jr., and I see Google when he's working for Google. I just imagine that boy a whole bunch taller. Yep, it's going to be the same geeky kid, just taller. Good job. Now, the thing is, where a diagnosis is helpful is on your relationships. I don't think it's that helpful on the work front. I'm seeing kids getting too babied. What you got to do with these kids is you got to stretch them. We got to be careful about multitasking. A job that's too hectic doesn't work. Shove them in a busy store during the holidays, that doesn't work. So you got to keep the hectic multitasking factor down. So we don't chuck them in the deep end of the pool. But if we don't stretch, they don't develop. Top down thinkers overgeneralize. Well, here's the iPhone app that can diagnose skin cancer. So the way this diagnoses melanoma is you show it 2,000 pictures of melanoma, then you show it 2,000 pictures of mosquito bites and everything else on the skin, and then it learns to categorize. It learns by categorizing. Or the more sophisticated program says we're not making any hypotheses up front, we're using patient-derived data to generate the hypothesis. And in today's New York Times, I kept an article with, uh, about the um, university down in Georgia that you know they want to help students to be successful. So they look at what they call an at-risk academic student. They make them come in, seven-week course, financial literacy, time management, where you can get tutoring. And then what they do, they take an AI program. Everything they do goes through it. They flunk the first quiz, 
the advisor's right after him. This would be a great program for a lot of the Asperger kids. And since it's done by the professors, they don't have to deal with all the stupid bureaucracy. Yeah, let's go drag him out of the room before he flunks out of school playing video games. Now, being a visual thinker helped me in my animal behavior work. Now, when I first started looking at cattle behavior, I did not know that I was a visual thinker. I thought everybody thought in pictures. It's been an interesting journey as I've learned that not everybody thinks in pictures. But being a visual thinker, I attend to visual detail. And cattle would often balk at shadows. I was just down at the North Carolina State Veterinary Clinic. There was a big metal drain across the concrete floor and the horses wouldn't walk over it. So they actually ripped up part of it and poured concrete in there. And then they get the horses to walk over the part where they poured the concrete in it. Now I wonder, how many people know what that is? Raise your hand. Oh, I guess you must have had the eclipse here. <laughs> yeah, those are eclipse shadows from a tree. I didn't know that eclipses made these weird shadows. This picture I took on the sidewalk in front of the Colorado State University Library, just when the eclipse was the most eclipse. We didn't have a total one. It was like 90, 95% eclipse. And other students walked over this, many of them. And they, it was right during when the classes were changing, and they weren't noticing it. I noticed the weird shadows. And then I looked down, and I realized what it was. So I noticed that the cattle might not want to walk past the chain that's moving, or a vehicle parked along a fence, or reflections. I get asked all the time if animals know they're going to get slaughtered. I'm more worried about a chain hanging down. Or maybe a piece of yellow tape on something. I went to two beef plants, and there was a paper towel hanging out of a dispenser. They were a lot more worried about that paper towel. All right, non-slip flooring, absolutely essential. You bring your dog into the vet clinic, give them a non-slip um, mat to, to stand on. Now I want to say how many people noticed that that animal was looking at the sunbeam. Raise your hand. Uh, the kids beat you totally. <laughs> I've shown this same slide to a lot of young kids. They see it much more, they much more easily see it. Now animal th uh, memories are specific because they're sensory based. An animal lives in a sensory-based world, not a word-based world. So you might have a dog that's afraid of a white veterinarian's jacket. So if the veterinarian takes a white coat off, then the dog will be fine. Or I knew a horse that was scared to death of black cowboy hats because you're abused by somebody wearing a black cowboy hat. Or a certain sound is associated with something bad. Or with something good. Cats know when the can opener is opening up the food. <laughs> Top-down thinkers tend to overgeneralize. Okay, my own career, rode horses in high school, and one of the few places where I was not bullied was horseback riding, model rockets, and electronics. Get kids involved in shared interests they can do with other kids. I learned carpentry work. I did all kinds of great things in experimental psychology class. I was a lousy student except for biology and writing. In ninth grade, I had better writing than some students today. Now, when you're weird, the way you sell a job is you got to show your portfolio off. So I'd show customers, you know, diagrams like this. This is the original dip vat that was shown in the movie. I had a very professional brochure. You might wonder why it's not in full color. Well, in the 70s, full color printing cost a fortune because you had to put it through the printing press four times. That's why it was called four color printing. So I wanted to make a really nice brochure that was like just black and white printing on really nice paper. There's the original project I did in 1976. There's a picture of it from my very first brochure. There's the one they built for the movie. And there's two of my projects starting in the early 70s. Now, one of the things I learned from spending 25 years working with construction, I'd sell a job, design a job, supervise its construction, and then I'd have to start it up. Construction is all about finishing things. You finish jobs. Another thing about construction, there's an urgency to it. You gotta get it done. And when we didn't have parts, we'd pick that phone up and we'd call until we got parts. Well, and if a kid ends up in the basement playing video games, we've failed. It's that simple. If the kid ends up owning a, owning a metal fabrication company, yeah, that's uh, really wonderful. 
And I have another book called Different Not Less, where older people on the spectrum, good jobs, the diagnosis gave them insight into relationships. That is helpful. On the job front, there's too much babying going on. Okay, who builds a great big factory? I've worked with every meat company. The visual thinkers like me, we're the drafting department. We lay out the whole entire plant, lay out all the equipment, lay out the site. And then the millwrights, they're the steel working people that invent very clever new equipment. Like I went in one of these new plants and they had a robotic arm, just a standard robotic arm, but they'd made a super clever tool to go on the robotic arm. And what they did is they didn't try to copy how a person would do it. They thought up something totally new. That's the same principle of my grandfather's invention. Andrew Nickian, who worked with him, who actually thought up the idea, grandfather made it work, came up with a totally different idea for an autopilot. Because everybody else was trying to connect the compass to the airplane steering. We all know how a magnetic compass moves. Can you imagine what a mess that would be? It just didn't work. And then the f mathematically inclined and trained engineers, we have to have them. Boilers, refrigeration, roof trusses, soil compaction, pre-stressed concrete design. Yeah, we, you need to have the whole team. Now, this is a beef plant. Now, again, a 2017 project. I just want to show you off some heavy steel work right there. It's called the center track restrainer system. You can look up my beef plant video tour with Temple Grandin if you want to see it working. But what I wanted to show is, look at all that steel work. Stupid people don't build that kind of stuff. And you need exactly the same skills to fix these bridges, to fix the plumbing in New York and Pittsburgh before it falls apart. I'm very, very aware of infrastructure stuff. Wisconsin takes care of the bridges. Yeah, then you go over to the next state, and it's like, ugh, all the rebar's showing in them. And, and then uh, here's some pictures of jobs. So when I sold Cargill back in the late 80s, I showed them that nice big drawing, my brochure, and then I showed them pictures like this. Basically, what you want to do when you're really weird is you want to give the client a 30-second wow. Don't put too much junk in your brochure. I never said anything about autism. I just showed off the work. This is what I could do for you. There's another one. There's another job right there. And I'm pretty proud of the fact that um, half the cattle in North America are handled in that center track restrainer system. I think that's doing pretty good for somebody they thought was mentally retarded, and I'd never, never amount to anything. And one of the things that really motivated me in my 20s is the one to prove it wasn't stupid. That was a very big motivator. And I was just talking to a wonderful uh, lady who brought me here tonight. And she has a friend um, that's making really good money in her job, but she wants to go to college, and I think it's just to prove that she can do it. You know, that she's got the smarts to do that. Now, in my 20s, when I was young, I made the classic mistake that most engineering type of minds make. I thought I could fix everything with equipment. Equipment doesn't replace management. Schools thought, well, Ah, we put internet in every school, it's going to make schools wonderful. That doesn't replace teaching. The thing that actually improved animal welfare the most was a very simple scoring system where I figured out five simple outcome measures. And then we have some stuff you ban that you're not allowed to do. Very, very simple, like traffic rules. Okay, there's a diagram of the center track restrainer system. And the thing I thought was so cool in the HBO movie is my actual drawings were in the movie. Real drawings from real jobs were in that movie. I thought that was cool. So these are the five simple things you measure. And it's like traffic rules. If you could only measure three, let's say, let's say the police could only enforce three traffic rules, what three traffic rules would you enforce for most public safety? OK, right there with the fancy um, shirt right there. OK, you're only allowed to enforce three. What would be the three most important traffic rules to enforce? All right, how about somebody else there? Oh, nobody wants to give me some ideas of what maybe one or two of them, okay, right there? Speeding, yes, is definitely one of them, okay? Stop signs, yep. But the thing I have found is that the thing that's the biggest one always comes up last, drunk driving. And the thing is, you can measure it with a number. And then I'm going to add texting and seatbelts to put for the top five. 
Why are seatbelts not in the top three? They protect me. They don't protect you against me. So that's why they're not in the top three. So the trick is, it's figuring out what simple things to measure. Then you get the power of McDonald's behind me. 1999. I collected baseline data. One of the things we measured is, uh, well, they make cattle dead on the first shot. And they were really horrible when I took the baseline data. And the reason they were so horrible, and only 30% could do it in 1996, is equipment was broken. That's management. Pure and simple. What's going to bring change in many, many different things is when big customers insist on people doing things right. I implemented that program. Now, they're not perfect, but they're a lot better than they were in the 80s and the early 90s. They were horrible back in the 80s and the early 90s. Now, when I learned that I had visual thinking and that my thinking was different than verbal thinking, it gave me a lot of insight into problem solving. Yep, we got to get the different minds working together. And just to end up, before we do questions and we do book signing, and I'll hang around until uh, everyone wants to finish talking to me, we've got to make sure we don't let these students get screened out. Because I've looked at the 50-year-old, 60-year-old, and the 75-year-old version of, of a lot of these students. They've had very, very successful careers. And I want junior to also be really successful. And then since autism has got lots of different levels, somebody that's got more challenges, well, let's make sure he learns how to feed himself, learns how to dress himself. I talked to one doctor. He took a guy out of an institution that couldn't talk, no skills. He taught him how to make coffee at the local gas station. So now he had meaning in life. He was known for his excellent coffee. And that's something that people appreciate having nice coffee. So let's just start doing some questions. OK, we've got some mics here they're going to carry around. Um, can one be like a combination? Because like I, I'm autistic as well, and I visualize in like. Oh, you can have combinations. Yeah. You can have combinations where there's visual thinkers mixed up with math thinkers. You can definitely have that, mm -hmm. absolutely definitely. And what are you doing right now? Um, Right now, I'm more kind of into the writing and drawing aspect. And are you old enough for a job this summer? Yeah. You're getting right. one this summer. <laughs> Nursing home is what I'm looking at. And the thing is, summer all the years I've been in construction, I, got, I take a no-nonsense approach to this. We're not going to think about getting a job. We're going to get one. And just make sure you keep the hectic factor down. McDonald's lunch rush, I would not recommend that. But there's lots of other things you okay. can do. No, you need to get a job. I don't want to think about getting a job. We've got to do it. And when I had the chance to go to my aunt's ranch when I was 15, mother gave me two choices. I could go, go for a week and come back if I hated it, or I could stay all summer. Not going wasn't an option. But she gave me a choice and come back in a week if I hated it. Turned out I loved it. All right, we got Dr. one Grandin, way in the back. We have one right back here. Why do you love science? Well, it was just so interesting. Uh, it was just interesting, you know, figuring out how things worked. What I really liked about the book about the inventors is it described sort of their quirky ways, but it also described how, how they had to work to figure out their invention. Okay, here's one right here. Okay. Hi. Um, do you think autistic children should be told they have autism? I'm talking about homeschool kids or kids that aren't in public school. Homeschool kids, we need to make sure we get them out doing enough other things with kids, and but as soon as they're age they, working. Should they know that they that there's a sometimes name they sometimes they need to know, especially when they're older kids when they have relationships. But what worries me is I'm seeing too many kids where autism is becoming their entire identity. This worries me because I think um, you know Mr. Metal Fabricator is more cool. Then, um, you know, then, yes, autism is an important part of who I am, but it's secondary to career. You know, and, one of the, and I learned working skills at an early age. I was thrown out of ninth grade for fighting, and my parents spent a lot of money to send me to an extremely expensive boarding school. You know what I did for the first three years? I ran their horse barn, and I cleaned nine stalls every day, and I learned how to work 
Academic skills and work skills are two different skills. I'm seeing kids graduate from college straight A's and then just lose it in the workplace. No, we need to, the kids that are young now, 11, dog walking, church and synagogue jobs, real, a real economy as soon as they're of age. We okay. have a question all the way in the back. All right, good. Hi, thank you. I'm a teacher, and so I appreciate your insight for, I think there are many of us here tonight. Who or what inspires you today? Well, you might wonder why I'm past retirement age, and now I'm doing more time lecturing than I am, you know, working in the cattle industry. I want to say the kids that are quirky and different be successful. That's something that really turns me on right now. It's a lot of hard work. Me, you know, another thing I learned is you have to work hard, but the other thing you have to do is see the door. There's a scene in the movie where I go up and I get the editor's card. Because if I realized if I got the editor's card, then I could contact him about doing an article for our State Farm magazine. And I had the guts to go up there and get the card. And one of the things that taught me that is when I was seven. Mother had me and my, my sister dress up in our best clothes and shake hands and greet all her party guests. Where I had to learn these social skills in a much more structured way that's not being taught today. You gotta teach these kids like they're in a foreign country. You can't just say you're too aggressive or something like that. You've got to explain to them exactly what, what they did wrong. Okay, we've got one in the middle okay. here. Hi there, I'm a teacher and I also have two children on the autism spectrum. And I have a two part question. Um, the first thing I would like to know is, as a young child, what would you say was the single most important thing that helped you achieve your goals? All right, let's just talk about the young child. Early intervention, I had severe speech delay. See, then you have the kids where they're eight or nine with no friends and they get a label. Severe speech delay, early intervention. And, what, and teaching a language. Uh, the other thing you gotta do is teach turn taking. How to wait and take turns. You gotta give the kid time to respond. They're like a phone on one bar. Give them time to respond. Well, social skills were taught in the 50s. And it was taught with what I call <laughs> teachable moments. Okay, so if I put my finger in the mashed potatoes and I stirred it all around, mother didn't scream no. She said, use the fork. She'd give the instruction. You've got to teach social skills like they're in a foreign country. Nothing is instinctual. By third grade, my art ability became apparent. I was encouraged to do lots and lots of different kinds of art and draw different things. I had a fabulous third grade teacher. She was super important. It was a series of steps. And what I'm seeing now is we're doing a pretty good job with a lot of little kids, but we're falling down. Middle school and teenage led video game addictions. There's some kids where video games are drug. There's other kids where they can play it a bit and then they can just leave it. Any benefit you can get, it's one hour a day. But the biggest problem I'm seeing now is sort of overprotected. Oh, poor little Tommy has autism. We'll order his hamburger for him. No, he needs to walk up to the counter and learn how to order it but we're gonna take them in there first when the McDonald's is not busy. We don't chuck them in the deep end of the pool. I remember when I was remodeling our kitchen, mother made me go to the lumber yard myself to buy the materials and I was scared to do it. It was absolutely the right thing to do. Now another issue is often anxiety. And the reason why I'm drinking so much water is I, have to t I take antidepressant medication. They got really bad through my 20s. You can get my book, Thinking in Pictures. I describe all my experiences. Low-dose antidepressants. The mistake made with antidepressant drugs is too high a dose, and you get agitation and insomnia. Antidepressants saved me. He also saved three other visual thinking designers that I worked with. One that was probably on the autism spectrum, the other two weren't. If they're taking low-dose Prozac, and they'd be on drugs and alcohol if they weren't on low-dose Prozac. It saved them. All right, I have another question in the back. Um, do you still see doors opening? Well, like I, I, um, I still think doors are kind of a metaphor. But when I was younger, and I had a lot less life experiences, in order to understand something like going into the future, I had to like think of an actual door. But the thing I figured out really early on 
was at certain times showing my portfolio to the right person opened up a lot of doors professionally. I also had to learn not to be so rude. On my very first job <laughs> that I showed there at the Swift plant, I criticized some welding and I said it looked like a pigeon doo-dooed on it. <laughs> and Harley, the engineer at the Swift plant, pulled me into his office. I had a little office down at the boiler room. And he didn't scream and yell at me. He says, we got to nip these little cancers before they metastasize. <laughs> and you've got to apologize to Whitey the welder. And I didn't tell him I thought the welding was wonderful, but I apologized for the rude talk. And then Harley explained that Whitey was his employee. And I should have come to him first if I didn't like the welding. But he explained to me what I should do. That was being the perfect boss for somebody on the autism spectrum. OK, we've got one right here. Um, how can I use my love of reptiles to invent something? Use what? Uh, you've got little mathematical tiles? Love reptiles. Reptiles. Fractiles. OK, I know fractiles are very similar to uh, Penrose, uh, to Penrose mathematics. You can start looking up all the mathematics that um, Stephen Hawking did. And you can find it all online. It's all available. Go look it up. His question was love of reptiles. Oh, reptiles. I thought yes. you said fractiles. Reptiles. Fractiles <laughs> are, are a mathematical pattern game. Reptiles? Well, you could um, be a wildlife biologist that studies reptiles. Um, and now, now I'm seeing some pet stores that think names like fins and scales. You know, sell reptiles. Yeah, you could go into a field where you work with reptiles. You know, I'd recommend uh, taking as many courses in biology. You get into college, do internships and wildlife management in places where you could work with reptiles. It's really important for students to do career-relevant internships. And then you find out careers that you've tried on that you like. And then there's careers you may have tried on that you hate. It's also important to find out. You know, something might seem really glamorous and wonderful, but when you try it on, you find out you don't like it. Or you try it on something you never expected. You find out you like it. Yeah, reptiles are something. You definitely can make a career out of that. All right, okay, right um, here. Okay. I have one to the left over here. Okay, fine. What should I do if people call me names because I have autism? Well, when I was your age, I had a lot of people call me names, and it was absolutely horrible. And the thing I would, one thing you need to do is get really good at something. And people will respect you when you're really good at something. And, uh, and get involved in activities at your school where you can have shared interests. Even when I was in college, I got called some names. And the thing that stopped it was we had a big school-wide variety show. I went to a small college. And so I made scenery for the show, and I sang funny songs in the show, and that was something I did with the other students. Those are the kind of things that can help you know, prevent a lot of the bullying, is get involved in shared activities, where it could be music, it could be art, it could be cooking, it could be computer programming, it could be robotics, it could be uh, English literature, it could be lots of different things. Okay, we've got here on your very far right. Okay, yeah, I can't tell where the sound comes from. Yeah. Okay. I can actually have like two questions, but I think I'll just go and do one up. You gotta talk into the mic because people can't hear you. Oh no, I don't want to turn it off. Okay. No. Okay, there we go. Okay, up. Uh, you said like there was like a four. You said of uh, four different types of thinking. Are there any other kind of types, or are there just four? Well. There's also uh, well, they, what, um, what a, uh, Gardner calls kinesthetic thinking, where it's more uh, you're, you might be a dancer or something with your body. But on the more academic things, well, there's a visual mind, things in pictures, that's an art mind, there's a pattern mind, you can mix the two together. What, kind of, what was your best subject in school? Uh, I don't know, I kind of can't tell right now. You like must have had some subject in school you liked and you were good at. Well, because of the program I was using, I kind of like math a bit. You like math? Yeah. I was, have you ever tried coding? You see, I think that's another thing yeah. you need to be doing in schools is introducing kids to coding. I saw this really neat ball that um, kids can program with an iPad. And I like that because that's bringing the computer world back to the real world. And you make the ball do things. 
you know, can be used for little kids to teach coding. Well, you won't know if you're good at coding until you try it. And there's all kinds of free stuff online, and there's jobs in that. Um, what are you doing this summer? <laughs> you look old enough for a job. I'm only 14. Oh, you're 14? So what are you doing this summer? <laughs> you didn't do a volunteer job. If you lived in Colorado, you could do a job in a retail store. It'd be legal in Colorado. What? Maybe you could do a volunteer job this summer. Probably mission work. What? Probably mission work. Okay, good. Would that be in another country? I'm thinking probably not. I like staying... No, I mean, one of the best things you like do is go to a trip right to another there. country. I don't like flying in planes, sir. No, but I know people on the spectrum have done mission work in other countries. Okay. That might be, and they, and they were really glad that they did it, too. It stretched them, but it was a really good thing to do. Okay, okay. Uh, right here, the green shirt. I'll just... Um, in school, did you have like a hard time with like getting in trouble? And if so, what did you do about it? Oh, I remember getting <laughs> riding my bikes in places I wasn't supposed to, and I got in trouble. I, uh, what kind of trouble did you get in? <laughs> Arguing. Mostly. I can tell you where I got in trouble one time. I found this big rotten apple, and we had a house that had like a thing called a banister, and I dropped it from the second floor, and it hit the hall table. It went all over, everywhere. Uh, my mother was not very happy about that. <laughs> I did that when I was about your age. So did you like learn from your mistakes, or like, did you, did you, how did you get corrected? Well, when I, one of the things is kid, one of the reasons why I want kids tinkering with different kinds of projects is, is that a lot of kids today are afraid to make a mistake. I had a lot of bird kites that did not work. And when the engineers were working on the wing, winglets on real airplanes, they had all kinds of models. They test them in wind tunnels. They don't just put this stuff on commercial airliners and test it. It's done on models. But they had to tinker. And they had designs they had to throw away. And today, I think a lot of kids get too worried about if they make a mistake. You know, what you want to do is make sure you learn from your mistakes. OK, Dr. Grandin, we have one to your left in the okay. front. Over, 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 over that way? Front. Yeah. All right, and how are we doing on time? Let's take two more. All right. How did you start liking cattle? Well, I was exposed to cattle when I was a teenager. So this brings up, the question was, how did I get to liking cattle? I was exposed to cattle as a teenager. I had no exposure to them as a young child. So this brings up a really important thing about careers. Students get interested in things they get exposed to. They find out they like it, or they find out they don't like something. You know, like some kids like their parents' business, for example. Other kids hate it. And I think one of the problems we have in some schools is kids aren't getting exposed to enough stuff to figure out what they might want to do as a career. One of the things that's happening in my field in animal science, we get lots of students that want to become veterinarians, and that's really good. But then they learn there's all these other interesting things they can do, like work for Perina over here, and they can do that with a four-year degree. And they'll might, they might try an internship at a company like Perina, and they find out they like it. You see, and then sometimes you can go down a different career path. Students either find out they like stuff they're exposed to, or they find out they don't like stuff they're exposed to. It's so important when you're in college to try on careers. So important. And try them on in high school, too. Okay, we got okay, one we more question. One more with Wonder Woman over here. Okay. What inspired your love for inventing? Okay, how I got to like inventing? I don't know. It was just fun to tinker with stuff. And when I went back to recreate my little helicopter project that's in Calling All Minds, so I go out and I buy the same airplane that I bought as a kid, a little wind-up propeller thing, but it had a problem. It had a real wimpy little stupid propeller and a really weak, wimpy elastic band. And the one I had as a kid, I could wind it up, set it on the road, and it would take off and maybe go about this high above this platform. This new one that I bought today, you know, I bought just a few months ago, it, only, it didn't even take off. It was so horrible. So then to try to make it into a helicopter, 
it was too heavy, so I had to cut all kinds of bits and pieces off of it. I had to keep experimenting and experimenting and experimenting. It wouldn't even fly as a helicopter at all. And I finally got it to work in the backyard outside of my house. And it was just like I was a little kid again. I got this stupid thing to work. Because I got to warn you, I couldn't get exactly the same parts for things that I had as a kid, so you're going to have to tinker. And when you tinker after a pile of mistakes, and you finally get it to work, that just makes you so happy, and I'm going to end there. Thank you very much.